Hi, Alsbetta. Hi, thanks Alsbetta. for inviting me. <laughs> Thanks for having you. So Alsbetta is a postdoc in computational chemistry at Uppsala University, uh, and she's also integrating physics-based modeling with data science approaches to get insights into infectious diseases. It's really good to have you. Hi, Alsbetta. Hi. So today, Alsbetta will talk about drug repurposing um, of COVID-19. Um, and drug repurposing in general is the investigation of existing drugs for new therapeutic purposes. Why is that such an important topic? So I think it's important to stress out that the development of novel drug is a very lengthy and expensive process, which can take up to several years until the drug gets to the market. So the drug repurposing is sort of an alternative way of how to rather look for already existing drugs and test their potential to be effective for treatment of a certain disease, which we are interested in. And by using the drug repurposing, we can definitely lower uh, the time Coast and also the, which are connected to potential side effects of those drugs because uh, these drugs has already undergone clinical trials. So there are definitely many benefits connected to drug reproposing approaches. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's fascinating. Um, and you decided to use NIME in conjunction with uh, Open Data for this project, right? Can yes. you tell us a little bit why you decided to do so? So uh, the reason to use uh, open data was not only the aim to get as much data as possible, but to also increase our data sets uh, by including compounds with different physical chemical properties. Because what we observed is that each and every database we used in our workflow is covering slightly different areas of chemical space. So by integrating all these data together, we definitely increase chemical space of our data sets, which in turn can be very beneficial and useful when when we perform some chem informatics analysis and similarity searches. And the reason for using NIME is that it provides us with a great platform to automate the whole procedure and also to use it for other different use cases or potentially adopt it to slightly different tasks which we are interested in. Very cool. Yeah. So you also brought some slides, right? Um, yes. So I think everyone is now interested and eager to learn more. Okay. So I hope you can see the slides. And uh, so, as I already mentioned at the beginning, the reproposing of drugs is a great strategy to advance drug development. And in our pipeline, we start with the definition of a disease for which we would like to find some effective drug candidates. And the first step is to find the targets which are being involved in this disease, which uh, can lead us to uh, finding the ligands which are shown to have a decent and known activity against the targets of those of our interest. And by knowing how the ligands, which are known to be active for those targets, look from the structural perspective, we can use this knowledge to finally identify null hits by using the similarity searches. So at this stage, I'd like to introduce you our workflow, which we created uh, for computational drug reproposing, which starts with uh, the open targets platform, which we used for finding the disease target associations. And next, uh, we integrated uh, the ligand data from different sorts of databases, such as, for example, protein data bank of protein ligand complexes. And we combined those data with uh, the data coming from different chemical databases of small molecules and their bioactivity values against different targets. And once we got the ligand data into our workflow, we looked for uh, some enriched substructures in a way that we first uh, simplified the compound structure into, a, into its scaffold, as is shown in the red in this picture. And then we just uh, kept the structures which were highly represented in the data sets by performing hierarchical scaffold clustering. And once we got uh, those enriched substructures, we use them as a structural keys or structural queries to perform virtual screening of external data sets. And finally, we end up uh, with the hits which are structurally similar to the known ligands and which could potentially be effective for certain disease. But since we want to uh, automatize the whole procedure, uh, we decided to use NIME. 
and uh, we take the advantage of the programmatic data access by using application programming interface, which uh, we did in a way that we first uh, specified the input data table, which in this case was a Uniport ID corresponding to a certain protein target. And we pass it uh, to the string manipulation node and created a specific API request. In the next step, uh, we fetch data from web services by using the get request node. And finally, we extracted the relevant information. And at this stage, it's really important to note that uh, the ligand data coming from different databases can be quite heterogeneous and inconsistent when it comes to their chemical representation. So what we had to do is that we had to apply data curation protocol to make sure that all the data uh, have, are having the same representation before we merge them. And uh, the workflow worked in a way that we first remove compound stereochemistry. We strip off the salts and other fragments. We subsequently neutralized the charges and checked atomic clashes. And finally, we filter up entry with some unusual elements. And then we took the standardized structure and generated inchi, inchi key, and canonical smiles out of it for further processing. And for performing substructure searches of external data sets, we created the following workflow, which uh, uses um, some external uh, compound data as an input. In this example, we use data from drug bank. And then uh, we created a loop where uh, the certain enriched substructure, which we derived in the previous step, is taken as an input. And uh, we use substructure filter to search and check whether this specific substructure is contained in the compound data, which we uploaded to the workflow. And we do this in an iterative way. So uh, in the end, we end up with a table of the identified hits which contain the compound structures and the specific substructure which has been found in there is highlighted in the red. So we use this workflow for different diseases and one of them was COVID-19 as a timely use case. And we were able to identify several interesting candidates. And it's interesting to mention that some of them have already undergone clinical trials. So we published this workflow as an educational article in the Journal of Game Informatics. And we also made the workflow available on GitHub and NimeHub. So if you are interested to learn more about the workflow or if you just want to try it out by yourself, you can just go to one of those sources. And at this stage, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Very, very cool. Thank you so much, Alzbetta. And I can definitely recommend to read the paper um, to the audience. It's super interesting. Um, and in that paper, you also mentioned that you used uh, those workflows to teach undergraduate students, right? Uh, for the course experimental methods in drug discovery and preclinical drug development. Can you elaborate a little bit on, on that? What did you do there? So we organized the course in a way that we split uh, the workflow into five different pieces and we always focused on certain aspect uh, and we dedicated the whole day to explain the specific part of the workflow. So for example, the first day we teach the students how to use API requests and how to use them to integrate data into the workflow. Then we also dedicated some time to uh, learn how to perform some chem informatics analysis in the CNIME. And at the end, the students were asked to pick up one of the hits, which they found upon substructure searches and did some literature search to see whether there is some connection of the specific hit to COVID-19, if, if there is something known about uh, some potential effect. Very so, cool. Yeah, nice, nice. Yeah. We from the life sciences team, for example, just, just reminded me when you showed the get request note and so on, we use that a lot to just to get data. I think that is very, uh, one of my favorite features basically in NIME because it's so easy to do. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question from the audience. And with that, I would actually give hand over to Anna in Constance. Definitely, there is a question here. I really like, thank you for the presentation, by the way. Um, the question is, what was the cutoff you used for the hierarchical clustering to define the reached structures? And how would you do it again if you're working with a new data set? So we use the molecular distance as a threshold for uh, for uh, for classifying the uh, scaffolds into specific clusters, and I guess we use the uh, molecular distance of 0 0.5, if I remember correctly. 
And the second question was, uh, sorry, I didn't. The second question is, how would you do it again if you were working with a new data set? Would you do something different? Uh, so I think that uh, what would be important is to check that when uh, when once uh, downloads the data from uh, the protein data bank, it can sometimes happen that uh, there are some ligands which are not the real bioactive ligands, but for example, some crystall crystallizing agents or some salts. So there is definitely a need to also check it manually whether uh, whether the data which we download makes sense. So I think this is what uh, should be taken into account when rerunning the workflow once again for different uh, type of disease. So, yes, great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Welcome. Yeah, Before thank you so time. much, Elspeta.